introduction. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Konstantin Lavetsky. So let me share my screen first of all. Um, cool. Do you see it? Yes. All right. So let's get started. Um, today we're going to talk about the most exciting things that you can do with Kotlin coroutines. Uh, so um, I would like to mention that our talk uh, will consist of two parts, the theory and then practice part. Uh, so I believe we will take some interesting information about internal coroutine structure in the theory, and then we'll try to apply those knowledge in practice in pretty unusual cases. And I believe that you will take something useful from this speech. So let's begin. Uh, first of all, let's take a brief introduction into what the curtains are. Curtains are a, a synchronous the mechanism provided by JetBrains, the developers of Kotlin, uh, that allows you to write a synchronous code to apply multi-threading and ju just do whatever asynchronous work that you need to do. Uh, the most di distinguishable feature of Kotlin curtains is that they essentially look like a plain synchronous code, but uh, it is uh, absolutely asynchronous friendly. It could perform any heavy tasks in background, but your, your code still will be much more readable and will look like a plain sequential code. So uh, visually, it looks something like this. So imagine you have a quarantine that is running on the main thread, then you just come to some heavy work function that does some heavy computation, for example, in the background. Uh, this work is done in worker thread, so it will not block the main thread, but instead the main thread will be just suspended. Then uh, heavy work will return its result back to the main thread and the routine will continue its execution in the main thread. So at the first glance, it seemed to me like kind of magic because um, it truly really seems extremely unusual as for me a developer who previously used Rx Java and other asynchronous frameworks uh, that you can write the code that is work on the main thread and could just uh, call some asynchronous work and then get back to the main thread and it all looks sequentially. So uh, let's get a deep dive into the coroutines and take a look just how are they structured inside. So um, let's consider three the most important components of coroutines, and those are continuation, job, and dispatcher. First of all, let's take a look at the continuation. Actually, it is basically the most uh, the most important, the base component of coroutines. Yeah, developers usually do not interact with continuation directly because it's more like implicit component, but still it's extremely important. So uh, let's take an example. Um, imagine we have a very simple uh, function, uh, coroutine uh, that calls some heavy work suspend functions and then update the UI using the result. So first of all, what Kotlin compiler does is he divides our coroutine into a several blocks, several our pods, and add the label to them. Uh, which is a, just an integer number. So the first part is zero, the next part is one. If we have like, uh, and the division points are suspend calls. So if we have like one suspend function called in coroutine, there will be two parts. If there, there are two suspend functions, there will be three and so on. So what's going on next? Then Kotlin compiler generates a kind of switch or when in Kotlin block for us and also it's a label uh, uh, label variable. Uh, this label actually mm, saves information that uh, talks us like which branch of the one we uh, should be executed. Um, all right, so then Kotlin compiler also generates a continuation class around our coroutine. So whenever we launch some coroutine, the continuation class is generated that wraps actually our uh, coroutine code and also it contains a resume function that just in turn contains the code that we will written in our coroutine that is divided into a several branches in WAN. 
So let's take a look how actually it could help us. Well, uh, what the Kotlin compiler also does is whenever we call our resume function and we go to the first branch of the when, the Kotlin compiler increments the label. So uh, when we just come to the first branch, it sets the label to one. So we could assume that whenever we invoke resume function again, we will jump right into the second branch. So, uh, all right, uh, let's go next. Then Kotlin compiler also generates a parameter, additional parameter for every suspend function. And this is a parameter of the continuation type. Uh, Okay, so, and we pass this continuation as this because our function is called in, in the continuation itself. So what's going on next? Then when our heavy work is completed, for example, in a background thread or some you know, callback delivers and so on, Kotlin compiler adds continuation.resume invocation. So we essentially, what we do is we call back our continuation resume and then we remember that we set label to one before so we jump right into the next branch and execute the next uh, code that we've written and that's it and that's it uh, well so essentially what the Kotlin compiler does is Kotlin compiler generates a callback he passes this callback into a every suspend function that's getting calling back and then we jump into the next branch so that we could achieve this behavior when code seems to be just uh, sequential, but instead Kotlin compiler divides this into the several blocks and passes this continuation just as a kind of callback. Yeah, it is definitely glorified, optimized, and just improved in, uh, in very big manner a callback uh, that works perfectly fine, that contains just the label. Uh, so we will know in which point we should continue our code. So we see that there is a glorified callback under the hood of the assessment functions. All right. Cool. That was the first mini chapter of uh, theory. Let's get to the second component. And these are dispatchers. There are a bunch of dispatchers. If you're familiar with RxJava, it is some kind of a schedulers. So the dispatchers let you specify in which thread or thread pool your code should be executed. You can, your coroutine should run in. The first dispatcher is default. So uh, it contains a thread pool under the hood and the amount of the threads in the thread pool is usually equal to CPU course amount. So in Android is typically, those are typically eight threads. Cool. The next one is dispatchers IO. It contains 64 uh, threads by default. So essentially uh, these two dispatchers actually use the same thread pool, but dispatcher default is only allowed to use eight of them and dispatchers IO use respectively 64. Well, default dispatcher is uh, more applicable to some heavy computations, uh, calculations, some, I don't know, video processing and so on, uh, all heavy lifting for CPU. Whereas IO dispatcher is a perfect choice for some input output operations like querying database, uh, like calling your API and so on. Also, there is a main dispatcher, but just for coroutines for Android, when you could post your uh, code, your coroutine to the main thread, and also there is unconfined dispatcher, which essentially does not contain any thread. Um, so it just executes your routine just whenever it was called. So it does not change any thread. And it's usually a good choice for testing. Uh, it also reminds me a scheduler trampoline from RxJava. Uh, all right, we remember that we discussed the continuation previously. We've just taken a look at the dispatchers and uh, now let's take a look how they play together. Uh, so we remember that Kotlin compiler generates a continuation wrapper around our coroutine. So it passes itself to the uh, your assessment functions. Your assessment functions call back continuation.resume. 
and here the dispatcher come to the scene. So dispatcher, for example, let it be main dispatcher. It intercepts this continuation dot resume call, and then the dispatcher dispatches um, this call to its own thread pool. So in our case, it's the main thread. And then main thread post it to its message queue, and then uh, your continuation resume is actually executed. So that we will not be affected by any threads that is used in heavy work because just heavy work could perform its uh, work in the background. So it calls continuation to resume in the background, but we intercept it and post it to our corresponded thread. And the last one is job. Uh, yeah, definitely there are a plenty more coroutine components, but uh, I'm going to talk about the three like, most important, most common. A uh, job uh, is a class that contains the state of your coroutine. So you could observe the life cycle of the coroutine, you can manage it, and so on. And also what uh, Kotlin uh, coroutines also provides in job is the references to jobs children. So that we could achieve a kind of cooperative style and proceeding our coroutines. So whenever we create a coroutine inside of other coroutine, those are associated so we could manage them. Uh, visually, it looks a little bit like a tree. So whenever we launch our coroutine, the job is associated with this coroutine. But then whenever we launch some nested coroutines using launch or sync builders, those coroutines also have its own job that is attached to the parent job. So uh, what we could achieve is we could achieve um, like a cooperative work of our coroutines. We could achieve structured concurrency so that whenever we need, for example, cancel of all, all of our coroutines, we can just cancel the parent job or the scope that contains a reference to the parent job. And the job will propagate the cancellation to all of his children so that all of our uh, all our tree of jobs will be disposed. Uh, so it's extremely useful, uh, especially for Android, when you need to cancel your job in on destroy, on destroy view, and other uh, lifecycle callbacks of use. All right, so it was a brief theory part. Uh, now get ready to jump into the practice part. Well, practice part was really important for me, so I decided to pick some non-trivial examples because I bet everyone here just is familiar with how to, I don't know, query your room database or query some retrofit API using Kotlin coroutines. So it wouldn't make actually uh, any error for you. So I picked some interesting example when you could apply your coroutines. So first of all, let's take a look at suspend functions. Well, We've just discussed that whenever we have a suspend function, Kotlin compiler generates a continuation around it, then, and continuation plays a role of callback for us. So, all right, we pass it to the us for suspend functions, suspend functions call back our continuation, and it just works. All right, so, but what if we think backwards? What if we have some callback in our application, just whatever callback, callback for network call, callback for UI, for some other third party libraries that are callback based. And is it possible to convert them into a suspend functions? And, that's, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, you can convert the callback uh, to a continuation and then calling compiler will uh, just convert your continuation into a suspend function. And there are two builders for suspend functions, and those are suspend cancelable coroutine and just suspend coroutine. Um, I personally recommend you using suspend cancelable coroutine as much as possible because you usually need to perform some cleanup to clean up some resources, close some streams and so on cancel your listener. So, and suspend cancel provides us with such possibility. All right, we see some familiar names over here. We see that continuation is passed inside of the Lambda of suspend coroutine. So uh, let's take a look, how can we use it? 
All right. Uh, so we see that we could have like some callback hell in Android, definitely, especially in the view layer when uh, we have a lot of callbacks that needs to be installed. For example, when you have some uh, on layout change listener on your main view. Uh, also, keep in mind that you should unsubscribe the listener uh, in on destroy view or on destroy, just whatever callback you need. Then imagine you have some nested callback inside. So whenever your layout changes, you run some animation and then you should wait until the animation ends and then perform some action. For example, update some data. And the code looks really messy. It is not readable. Moreover, you need to un uh, unregister your listeners somewhere in on this review. So um, actually, that's not the code that I would like to, to see. So let's take a look how could we transform it using Kotlin coroutines. First of all, let's convert our outer callback is layout change listener into a suspend function. So let's write a suspend extension for, for the view that is called await next layout. Then we can use suspend cancelable coroutine builder. We see that there is a continuation passed inside of our function and let's take a look how can we use it. All right, first of all, we definitely need to install our listener, all right? so. We just create our listener, we write our methods and add them to, to the view. But what's next? Then we call a very important method. We call continuation.resume. So we remember that uh, from the theory part that whenever continuation.resume is called, um, we actually continue execution of our coroutine from the point that we left off. So our coroutine could remove its execution. And here we signals that whenever our layout is changed, we want continuation to resume its execution. So our coroutine is just going on from this point. Also take a look at continuation.invoke on cancellation methods. So this methods uh, takes a parameter of the Lambda uh, that and this lambda is going to be invoked when our continuation is cancelled. For example, when we cancel our coroutine scope or when some error occurs. So we could perform some cleanup in this callback. And we respectively call remove on layout change listener and unregister our listener. So there will be no memory leaks and so on. All right. We're done for the first step. Let's take a look at the another one. Well, we remember that we also had an nested animation listener uh, in our callback. So let's write another extension. Uh, okay, we use a suspend cancelable coroutine, we register a listener, and then we call continuation.resume. All right, it works just the same way. Whenever our animation is ended, we signals to the continuation that, all right, right now, let's resume the execution of coroutine. Okay, here we go. And let's take a final look at this case. Okay, so first of all, we had some callback hell, some messy code, moreover with unregistering in on destroy. And now it turns into a perfectly readable code. Uh, then when we clearly see which, which, which steps are going on. So first of all, we await layout, then we await for some animation, and then we update our data. Plus it, this approach brings us uh, several more uh, benefits. First of all, those functions are reusable. So whenever you need to install another layout change listener, you can just go ahead and reuse this function. Also, these functions are self-cancelable. So you know you don't need to handle this removing of listeners and so on. Just your function will do it just for you. So and that's the awesome result. Cool. Let's next jump into a channels. So what the channels are? Channels are coroutines unit, coroutines class that is intended for communication between coroutines. So whenever you need to send some uh, 
values, some objects, just whatever, to uh, some other coroutines. The channels are a perfect way to do that. They are thread safe, so your coroutines could just run simultaneously and then send some data, and channel will handle it for you and then dispatch the, your data to some other coroutines that are observing those values. Essentially, uh, it always seems to me that channels are really underrated uh, uh, as for Android developers, uh, but, but, but they could do a really awesome job. And let's take a look how they can help us. So first of all, let's take a look how they could look in the code. So imagine you have a channel, you have some coroutine that sends some data. You have another coroutine that also sends data and you have a third Coroutine that consumes the data using a for loop, by the way. It's a very interesting uh, feature of Kotlin compiler that you use some just for loop for channels. It looks really awesome. Uh, moreover, uh, we need to mention that channel.send function are suspending. So Kotlin, uh, so channel makes sure that our coroutine will not continue its execution until the value that is being sent is consumed. So whenever our first and second value that are delivered to our third coroutine, uh, our code of the first two coroutine will not continue. Okay, so the good question is how can we apply the channel in a real Android development? And I can say you, it's a good choice for one-shot events. When you need, for example, just to display a snack bar or, sh or, so, or show some one-time message to, to user or just do some another work that needs to perform just once. So you can create a channel. And then, for example, when you have some error, you can send to this channel a, your error message, which is whatever message you need. And then you can observe those messages in your fragment, for example, or in your composable function activity, just whatever you use. So uh, you also can convert this channel as a flow, but actually it's still a channel under the hood. It's more like just a representation. Okay, cool. Next part is flow. Flow are, I bet you, you could be familiar with the flow, but anyway, let me just kind of remind you what the flow are. Flow uh, is the stream of some events and that are built on coroutines, on suspending. Uh, so you can emit some values from flow and you can just apply then some operators like map or filter or just whatever, whatever you want. Then you can collect this flow in your client. Cool. So let's Take a look how some how Kotlin could improve how flow could improve our code. So imagine you have some API for retrofit, just for GraphQL or whatever endpoint you're using. And that contains a suspend function named load shops that takes location as a parameter and that returns the list of the closed shops to the supplied location. All right. Then you have a repository. And your business, uh, your product manager just came to you and asked you to do the following tasks. So um, you should have a, a next, the next user flow. So whenever user changes its location, for example, he, he goes back and forth in his city or just whenever in some mall and so on. And our application should load the closest shops in a real time. So users should not manually you know, swipe to refresh or click a button, just refresh, refresh, refresh to see some new shops, but instead application should do it on its own. All right, so how can Flow help us to in this particular case? Let me tell you why. So first of all, we need to write an extension for Fused Location Provider that returns the flow of location so that we could transform our locations into a stream. All right, first of all, we install a good old callback. We just then request location updates, but then we should wrap our callback with callback flow function. So this is function that could help you to convert your callbacks that happens occasionally 
do a flow. So, uh, okay, you wrap it, you provide a lambda where your location, uh, where your callback is located. And then whenever on location result is invoked, so our location update is delivered, we try to send the location into the flow. And that's it. So also what we need to do is we need to install a wait close callback. So this wait close callback, make sure that our callback flow function will not just return its execution because if we did not install it, um, our callback flow will, will return immediately and no updates will be delivered. So we should await closing our flow. And also we, we could supply a Lambda to this await close function that will be invoked whenever our flow is closed. So it means we unsubscribe from it, from our view, for example, and so on. Uh, and we also clean up resources. So we remove this location updates, callback, and that's it. Let's take a look how can we use it. Okay, and we could use it pretty smoothly because what we do is we call the get location flow on our fused location provider, and then we map the latest, the most recent, the most actual location of user to our list of shops. And that's all. And when we then receive the flow of shops that are that will be updated in the UI. And the last part of my our speech is a select keyword. Select is pretty rare. Um, I personally haven't seen it in any big project, but unfortunately, because it could be really useful in a lot of cases. So let's take a look what the select is. Select is the keyword that allows you to do the following work. So imagine you have a several coroutines that are running in parallel, right? That do some on a request on API or do some computation for you, just no matter. Um, and you need to consume the coroutine that returns the fastest, that the first returns you to it returns you some value. All right, so imagine you have three coroutines, the one returns in 200 milliseconds, another one in 70, and the third coroutine in, in 300 milliseconds. And you obviously need to use the coroutine two, all right? So you can apply a result to, to your coroutines and then consume the second coroutine result. Also, if several of your coroutines returns at the same time, the select is biased to the first registered one. Um, also, select perfectly works, not just for, for example, async builders, but also for deferred that is returned by async. Uh, it works good for a job and also could be applied even to a channel. Okay, let's take a look at the typical usage of it. All right, so imagine you have two coroutines that are running in parallel. The one is job and another one is async. So the job returns in 100 milliseconds and async returns in 20 milliseconds. All right, you wrap them with the select keyword that returns some value. In our case, it's a string. And then we register our coroutines within on join or on await uh, functions so that our select is listening to our register coroutines. And then we print the result of the select. So obviously we see that the first coroutine is run in 100 milliseconds and the second one in 20. So obviously the result will be deferred hello world. So we the select consumes the result of the second coroutine. Cool. And let's take a look at the example at the real case. So imagine you have a some APIs for example, bank KPIs, all right? Each of them returns some currency information, for example, and you need to consume the fastest one, all right? So you'll just run them in parallel and you await for the fastest response. But you have a condition that if your response take more than five seconds, you have a just a timeout for them. And then if this timeout is, exceeds 
uh, you, do, you should apply some data from cache just to, to not to make user wait another five seconds and so on. Okay, so let's let's get down to the code. So you have three bank API that looks a little bit pretty similar. They all return currency info and all of them are suspending functions. Okay, then you have repository that references all of those three APIs and you have get currency info that is supposed to return the fastest bank APIs response. Okay, uh, you launch all of those three um, requests in parallel and wrap them with coroutine scope. And all right, here is the question. What can we do next? Actually, without a select, it's pretty hard to figure out how to await exactly the fastest one. Yeah, you could just, I don't know, come up with some flags or some, I don't know, that points to the um, result that returns the first or, or something. Uh, you could, I don't know, uh, use some channel to observe um, the first value uh, that is consumed, that is delivered to this channel. But it's all our kind of hacks uh, for us. So how can we apply select to this? And the answer is we can apply it quite easily. So we wrap our coroutines with the select, we register them all using on await, and then we return the actual result of our um, coroutines, so using just it. Okay, so now we are waiting for our responses. Um, yeah, re registering using on await. But then we remember that we had a condition that if the timeout exceeds five seconds, we should fetch info from some cache resources from disk or just whatever. Um, and selects provides us with a very handy function that is named on timeout that consumes actually a timeout value. And that is also consumes <clears throat> the Lambda that will be invoked to return the uh, value for timeout case. And in our situation, we just fetch information from cache. All right, and that's it, it just works. Uh, we have a repository with the select keyword that fetches all of our three APIs. Then we are waiting for the fastest response. And whenever our uh, we time out, times out uh, more than five milliseconds, we could just fetch information from cache and return the response to the user. All right, so let's take just a brief conclusion. We see that coroutines actually could be applied not just to room or for, to retrofit, to GraphQL and other like classic cases, but instead you could, be, you could build an entire ecosystem using your coroutines. You could build view, you can, build a view model, you can interact between your yeah, layers using Kotlin coroutines. So, and your your code will just work perfectly well because Google is reg and JetBrains are regularly maintain our coroutines and all of new components that are developed by Google or JetBrains or are the developers usually um, works perfectly well with coroutines. So don't lose this chance, use them as soon as possible. And uh, I bet you're gonna appreciate it. Okay, thank you all for your time. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to ask them. I have a question. You mentioned several ways to create coroutines using, for example, launch uh, and async. Uh, yeah. uh, those uh, coroutine builders provide uh, the tool to launch coroutine, uh, probably in background threads uh, in case we use uh, dispatchers uh, IO and default. Uh, but for example, in unit testing, we don't need that concurrency in most cases, but still we need to use coroutines. Is there any way to launch coroutines the way that we don't have to switch to switch to another background threads uh, but to block the current thread yeah that's a really good question and i have the answer um you remember the part about the dispatcher so we could have uh, the, a default main and io dispatcher but also there is a dispatcher unconfined and just you can use this dispatcher for launching your coroutines in your 
tests, for example. So because this dispatcher does not like post our coroutine to any thread, but instead it just do the work right away. So it will be done in your test thread. So you will not have any asynchronous computation, but instead they will be 100% sequential. Also, there is a function run blocking, uh, for example, and you need, uh, that is also does not just make any asynchronous work, but instead it's a builder for coroutine that will launch this coroutine just right away in the thread that you created this coroutine. Yeah, I have uh, several questions as well. So first of all, uh, thank you for your speech, great one. And uh, uh, so as far as I can see, the most things that uh, are done uh, in your examples can be easily achieved uh, with the Rx as well. So using subject, for example, and so on. And uh, most of the projects, uh, well, and uh, especially legacy ones are now using uh, Rx libraries. And uh, is there any performance benefits using uh, Coroutines uh, over the uh, Rx libraries, and uh, the second question: uh, How does Coroutine uh, handle the uh, back pressure? Is there any back pressure strategies, and so on? Yeah, all right. Thanks for for the good questions. Well, the first one is benefits over Rx Java and other asynchronous frameworks and yeah definitely there are raw benefits um, first of all those are just syntactic benefits because coroutines demands much less code much 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 less code so all a rigs java just chains of operators looks really huge and it's much more difficult to i don't know to get familiar with them to understand what they actually do uh, also, Kotlin coroutines are uh, supported out of the box by a ton of Google develop uh, Google um, uh, architecture components like View Model, Work Manager, Room, and so on. There are just a whole lot of them, but those are just visual uh, benefits. Talking about uh, the performance stuff, yeah, coroutines are also <clears throat> optimized very well because they um, just whenever you have, for example, your a coroutine and you get to some suspension point, the thread that is, use, uh, that is launching this coroutine will not just be blocked and wait until the operator is completed, until the suspend function is completed, but instead it just passes the continuation to the suspend function, and then the thread is free, so it can do some other work. For example, he can pick up just another coroutine or you should do some other useful stuff. So you will not just waste your threads just by waiting for for some response, but instead um, coroutines are ma coroutines manage your thread pool really efficiently, so that you will not see any performance downsides. And another question regarding back pressure. Yeah, back pressure is uh, a question regarding flow, I guess. And flow actually does uh, support back pressure. By default, um, they perform their back pressure just by suspending because um, uh, flows operators like collect, it is a suspend function. So your when you end flow send operator is also a suspending so whenever you try to send for example a some value to the flow and the previous one is not has not been consumed yet your send to a flow call will be suspended until the consumer actually accepts your uh, the past the, the previous uh, value and just you know display it or do just whatever job that it needs but if you need to have some more advanced back pressure strategy, for example, then you need to buffer some values or just to drop some oldest values. Yeah, there are also a bunch of operators for flow, like flow.buffer. And then you could specify how many, for example, 
uh, items you want to buffer. So you buffer, for example, three or four or five uh, just items and your <clears throat> provider, your flow builder will not be just suspended by waiting for the consumer to accept those values, but instead it will put it to the buffer and then just go on working. So yeah, there are a bunch of ways uh, for uh, handling the pressure in flow. Hey, thanks. Yeah, thank you too. I have another question regarding jobs that are produced in some uh, scope. Uh, what is the way to cancel all possible jobs? Well, it's a good question. Well, first of all, whenever you launch a coroutine inside of other coroutine, uh, the, the parent coroutine um, it contains a references to all of his children. So um, whenever you cancel your parent coroutine, all of his children will also be canceled. That's called a cooperative style of coroutines. So that your coroutines are not just running in some chaotic way uh, with no structure, but instead they are structured in a kind of tree of jobs. So whenever you cancel the root tree, all of his children will also be canceled. And the same behavior is usual is by default applied to errors. So whenever there is some error in your root coroutine, all of his child coroutine will also is, will be canceled because of the error. Yeah, there are definitely a plenty of strategies of handling errors in coroutine, but that's that's another question actually. Okay, cool. Any other questions? I think if there are no more questions, uh, I want 